I'm Dr. Lindsay Doe, this is Sexplanations, and we have a sibling channel called Nature League. The host, Britt Gardner, is here to tell me and you about the evolution of orgasms. Hi, Britt. Hello. I am so excited to be here. Thank you so much for thinking this up, and I'm really pumped to talk about this. I'm a PhD student in wildlife biology. On Nature League, we talk about life on Earth and why it's awesome. <coughs> what are some of the, the common hypotheses that you have heard or know of? Uh, that it is, what is it called when um, it's like a tail, that it no longer has a purpose, that it's evolutionarily just disappeared? Yeah, vestigial, sometimes yeah. we use that, yep. Uh, the clitoris, that it's like um, an undeveloped penis um, that has all of the erogenous tissue and the ability to have an orgasm, but it's just an aside, or that it does increase the fertility of mm -hmm. the female because if she has an orgasm, then she's more likely to have contractions and draw the seminal fluid in with the sperm in it. Right, and all of those seem legitimate anatomically, but there's still something a little bit missing because it was looking at humans. And so this team two years ago, what was really cool, in 2016 came out with a paper where they said, all right, that's cool. These hypotheses have been on the table, but what if we go back and look at what organismal female orgasms potentially did way earlier on in the mammal lineage. This is so exciting. I'm so excited. I know. The, the phrase mammal lineage gets me very excited too. Don't you <laughs> worry. I'm thrilled about it. So they look back and what winds up uh, coming into play is actually ovulation. It just so happens that there are a couple different ways that mammals uh, ovulate. One of them is environmental. So there's some kind of a cue. Uh, a lot of times photo period, so the period of light in a day or in a season. And that triggers... The, I'm so excited! Right? So, yeah. and, and that's like completely mind-blowing that your the eye picking up an amount of light makes an ovary release an egg light. Like, that's amazing how tied in we are to our environment. And so you have that for certain species that need to do it seasonally, something like that. You also in mammals have something called uh, induced or partner-induced ovulation. And this actually comes from the act of copulation. Cats. Totally. Okay. Oh, you're good, man. She's good. What's cool though is actually thinking about why something like cats. So this partner-induced ovulation we see actually in North American predators that have really wide ranges. Well, if you have really wide ranges, you're not as likely to find a reproductive partner, right? A lot of home ranges and especially cats behaviorally a little more solitary. So if you were cued by the environment, it's possible that there wouldn't be a mate and you're like, dang it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so instead, the ovulation occurs because of the act, which makes sense if you're that kind of a species. So if you don't know, um, ca domestic cats at least have spikes on the penis that go into vagina and kind of scrape the vaginal walls so that it Tell me stimulates more. Delightful. <laughs> ovulation. <laughs> is that all cats? Um, pretty sure. I don't know if the barbing is exactly the same okay. in larger species, but for sure we see even in larger cats, so like I was saying, North American carnivores, so thinking about like a, a mountain lion or a cougar, absolutely it's that, it's that the act of copulation that is, that is triggering and inducing the, the ovulation. <laughs> Just like that. That's actually scientifically accurate. It's what it sounds like. Ovulation. <laughs> yeah. You're horrible. Why are you tearing my vagina apart? <laughs> Pretty much. And they're like, ovulation, you're welcome. <laughs> yeah. So environmental and induced, or partner induced or copulation induced. And then you might be thinking, well, I, I don't do either of those. Mm -hmm. And that's true because uh, primate lineage, um, so us and other primates, uh, not all primates, but most, do something called spontaneous ovulation, meaning that nothing is inducing it, like it's not an environmental cue, it winds up being a, a cycle. So with humans, we talk about the, you know, an ovulation cycle, a menstrual cycle. Yeah. So this is a really kind of unique thing in mammals, particularly uh, primates. And so that is now where this research team looked and said, okay, if we wanna get to the bottom of this, we wanna look at which happened first in evolutionary time. Yeah, and so like which, like which one of these was, was earlier on? And one way to do that is to look at older groups of species, so getting out of mammal town and heading in and looking, yeah, mammal town, TM. <laughs> And it turns out environmental cues for ovulation we see in fish and also some amphibians. So that's okay. a way earlier 
version, if you will. So then the question mark was, all right, so then which one came first? Was it the copulation induced or was it this spontaneous? So they decided, let's figure out some traits that we can kind of define and say, yep, that's orgasm. So in this study, the way that they said, we're gonna look at and, and cue in and say, yes, that is a, again, chromosomal female uh, orgasm was neuroendocrine reflexes. So the brain is the neural part and endocrine, so hormones and reflex being we're responding to something. Um, in this particular case, they looked at two specific hormones. What they found that was the most common to look at was prolactin and also oxytocin. <laughs> yeah. Bonding, right? Of course. So in this specific study, they said, cool, let's go ahead and define that female orgasm as this reflex of prolactin and oxytocin. And then they looked across species and wound up finding that almost all of the organisms uh, that they looked at in these trees were more likely to have this induced uh, ovulation. And that wound up correlating to where the clitoris actually is in relationship to the vaginal orifice. Okay, <laughs> there's so much going on right now. I know. All right, so you've got a tree. Yeah that is mapping out all these different mammals. Yep, and we call that a phylogeny. So a phylogenetic tree is showing the relationships and histories of different species. Okay. Totally. And you're looking at their hormones and you're specifically suggesting that it would be prolactin and oxytocin that are going to change throughout this tree to help us indicate whether or not these orgasms are induced like cats, totally. whether they're spontaneous or cyclical like human beings. Yeah, exactly, and these primates. And so we're, we have that tree exactly, and then we make a second phylogenetic tree Okay. that instead of showing that trait, it is showing a trait specifically where the clitoris is anatomically what? compared to the vaginal orifice. Okay, and? And it almost lines up perfectly that the clitoris being away from, instead of inside or right on the edge of the vaginal orifice, almost lines up one-to-one -one with the spontaneous or the cyclical uh, ovulators. What? Yeah. Which tells us that the clitoris, if it anatomically is basically right there, either inside or right along the vaginal orifice, for these species who are induced by copulation to ovulate, of course it plays the role, right? This female orgasm with clitoral, that tissue anatomically is doing the thing. Help an ovulation, do it. And then when it moved away anatomically over time, it was only afforded to do that because evolutionarily speaking, we'd kind of figured out how to have this whole like cycle thing instead of just being induced. Wait, wait, wait. So you're saying that in organisms that have induced ovulation, yes. the clitoris is closer to the vagina or even within it yep. than organisms like us yeah. that have cyclical ovulation. Yeah. And I so even though I think my clitoris is really close to my vagina, it's actually much further than it's other It's like species. miles away. Are you kidding me? Like that inch is like evolutionary miles. <laughs> And you're saying also that the reason why it has been afforded the possibility to separate more is because uh, my body over right. evolutionary time has figured out a way to run on a cycle rather than totally. than penis being induced. Spikes. Okay. Yeah, cycles, penis spikes, mm, you know, trade-offs <laughs> in the balance of life here. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> I'm trying to think, like, what is better, menstrual cramps or penis spikes? And so the conclusions of this paper are like, look, if you get a little bit out of this anthropocentric or human-centric approach to this question and really just look at the lineage of mammals, you see that the older trait was having, not only environmental is definitely older for ovulation, but that induced ovulation is the older ancestral trait. And then over time, only this weird group, these weirdos that are called primates, have not only this different way of ovulating, but it also lines up with their anatomy, um, which is just ah, form and function, nothing like it. Anatomy and physiology is one of the coolest ways to, to demonstrate evolution and change over time. I mean, just like how wild is that, that there is actually a correlation between where the clitoris is in relation to the vaginal orifice and the kind of ovulation you have? That's so I cool. I know, so doesn't that mean that it will just like keep going? It'll be and here in like, like 
20 generations, probably like at nipple. Oh. I'm hoping it's going to be on the neck. Yeah, but if it was like next to nipple, you just get two for one. And there's just three pleasure zones like within eight inches. That's not bad. That's efficient is what that is. Efficiency, Lindsay, efficiency. This is what makes you so cool. Uh, so if you want to check out more about Brit's mind, how it works, and how much she knows in terms of nature as a whole, Nature League, youtube.com slash Nature League. Brit, thank you so much for teaching us. Thank you, Lindsay. This has been awesome. Stay, Stay curious. curious.